everyone and uh, uh, wish you all a happy new year. So we're going to get started with our um, weekly grand rounds. Uh, and uh, today uh, we have a distinct pleasure to have uh, amongst us uh, Dr. Anwar Shahal. Uh, Dr. Anwar Shahal uh, is going to give his uh, talk on uh, genomic and precision medicine with a focus in cardiology. Uh, Dr. Shahal is a consultant cardiologist uh, and director for Center for Inherited Cardiovascular Diseases at Wellspan Health. Uh, he's also concurrently holds the appointment as research associate at Mayo Clinic and also uh, as uh, a cardiac electrophysiology uh, specialist with the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, what I've learned in a very brief period of time ever since he was introduced by a common friend of us um, uh, is that Dr. Shahal is extremely driven uh, and is very passionate about uh, uh, the, the recent developments in genomics and precision medicine. But his journey started long back um, as a fellow uh, with Papworth Hospital, University of Cambridge, and as an associate tutor of the Royal College of Physicians of London. So he spent a considerable amount of his formative year uh, dedicating to research uh, uh, and his post uh, doctoral research in the UK before he came to Mayo Clinic and worked under the mentorship of Dr. Somers and Dr. Ackerman, who are both well renowned in cardiology as uh, clinical investigators, and had an American Heart Association Fellowship Award. Uh, subsequently, he continued his clinical training and also his uh, interest in imaging. Uh, in addition to electrophysiology and, and devices and, uh, and inherited cardiac disease uh, to complement his uh, interest in arrhythmia mechanism research. Uh, he's uh, uh, fully trained and board certified in internal medicine, cardiology and uh, echocardiography, and also in electrophysiology. Uh, and uh, he has uh, uh, done uh, prolific work recently with a uh, specific focus uh, on genomics and cardiology has over 40 peer reviewed publications and articles and book chapters and several uh, grants uh, uh, currently that he's uh, continued to pursue. Uh, and uh, we are really thrilled that today he's gonna to provide us an overview uh, on uh, precision medicine and to complement his talk, we're equally delighted uh, that for our panelists, we have uh, with us uh, a distinguished panel with Dr. Ray Panettieri, who's our Vice Chancellor for Translational Medicine and uh, Science Director for Rutgers Institute for Translational Medicines and uh, a Professor of Medicine at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. Uh, he's joining us along with uh, uh, Kristen Peterson. Uh, Kristen recently has been a workforce uh, for us, particularly he has, she has taken an enormous interest in uh, developing the concept of uh, a heart and vascular institute. Uh, she joined us uh, uh, from uh, Stanford, uh, where she was uh, the director of strategy. And currently, uh, she's the chief strategy officer for the Rutgers Barnabas uh, Health System. So with those, uh, I think uh, we are ready for a journey into genomics and precision medicine. And followed by, we will have an exciting panel discussion. So Anwar, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. And it's a pleasure to meet everyone. Uh, belated Happy New Year. I hope everyone's staying safe with the uh, changing tide with the pandemic. Uh, without further ado, I'll progress ahead. So, okay, I have no uh, relevant conflicts of interest or relationships with uh, industry other than being a supporter of genomic and precision medicine. I'm gonna skip over my bio, you've got my CV, uh, and we'll get straight to the pretest question. So regarding Anderson Fabre disease and females, which of the following is correct? Females do not show cardiovascular disease due to the condition being excellent recessive. Females only get conduction system disease and do not get uh, structural hypertrophic changes. Females can be reliably tested with serum alpha-1 galactosidase levels. Females can mimic all forms of sarcomeric hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, including obstructive disease due to lionization. And there's a typo there. It should have been L-Y-O-N-I-Z-A-T-I-O-N. 
Um, so I'm going to leave that up just for 30 seconds. And uh, I'd like you to just think about that and hopefully we can get you uh, oriented with this uh, particular uh, condition and how genomic and precision medicine makes a difference. Okay, so uh, learning objectives, essentially, uh, I, I'm going to really give you um, an overview of genomic precision medicine in uh, <laughs> 35 to 40 minutes, uh, which is a challenge. I once saw Nilesh Samani, who's the head of the British Heart Foundation, have to deliver the, uh, a similar lecture at the British Cardiovascular Society, and, uh, and he just sort of laughed his way through it, really, because it was just not possible. So I'm going to try to do that um, in as short a time as possible. But I want to, you know, deal with the varied audience that we have. Everyone's at different stages and different understandings uh, about what it is. So uh, I'm going to illustrate with some clinical examples about how does this actually impact you today and how you could apply that to your practice. So the outline will be some definitions, the central dogma of biology, then we'll do some cases. And if we get short in time, I've got four uh, real life from the uh, vaults uh, cases um, that I've seen in the last uh, year. Um, uh, if we are short in time, I'll cut back on those, but uh, hopefully you really enjoy that. And then sort of, I wanna give you a very brief flavor of the sort of research that I'm doing. I'm just gonna present a, a study we've done over the last year. And then we're gonna summarize with how genomic precision medicine, um, where it's actually going in the future and what, uh, what to expect in cardiovascular diseases. So let's move over to some definitions. Uh, I'm a big proponent of grammar, logic, rhetoric, a classic liberal arts education, the trivium. And so I always like to start with these things. And I'm sure if I survey you and ask you what does precision medicine mean, we all kind of know what it means, but when it comes to pinning it down, it becomes very difficult. So is it uh, also known as individualized medicine, precision health, bespoke medicine, genomic and precision medicine, inherited cardiovascular diseases, genetic cardiology, what, what does any of that mean? So if we look up some of the definitions, the NIH, the National Cancer Institute, uh, and oncology has really been at the forefront with genomic and precision medicine, described it as a form of medicine that uses information about a person's own genes or proteins to prevent, diagnose, or treat disease. And what they really mean is cancer. If you ask the American Heart Association, an evidence-based approach that uses innovative tools and biological and data science to customize disease prevention, detection, and treatment, and improve the effectiveness and quality of patient care. If you look at the Precision Medicine Initiative, they will say an emerging approach for disease treatment and prevention that takes into account individual variability in genes, environment, and lifestyle for each person. You'll hear the term personalized or preci uh, precision used interchangeably, but I would really argue that they're not really the same thing because um, colloquially we may mean that, but really personalized we've been doing for a long time. We don't just dish out the same drug to the same people, do we now? Um, you know, the, uh, the, so the more seasoned physicians will say, no, we, we do uh, individualize our treatments to the person in front of us. So you may not put an ICD in somebody who's 90 who may meet all other criteria because the life expectancy is not there. So you are personalizing it. If you put a subcutaneous device in or a transvenous device in, you are personalizing it. Um, but really what it means here is that um, precision takes into account some of the biology, some of the omics, that's the key distinction here and integrates that um, to eventually be able to deliver a more personalized uh, uh, treatment plan. But really the Precision Medicine Initiative took hold when uh, President Obama in his State of the Union address in 2015 and brought it to the forefront. So here, uh, doctors have always recognized that every patient is unique and doctors have always tried to tailor their treatment as best they can to individuals. You can match a blood transfusion to a blood type. And that was an important discovery. What if matching a cancer cure to our genetic code was just as easy just as standard? What if figuring out the right dose of medicine was as simple as taking our temperature? And that led to this uh, Precision Medicine Initiative. And the mission statement is to enable a new era of medicine through research, technology, and policies that empower patients, researchers, and providers to work together towards development of individualized care. So uh, 
this led to a lot of uh, funding as well. Um, and the funding contributions, uh, 129 million went to the NIH to do that. And they set up the NIH All of Us um, program, uh, which is really what I call the US Biobank. Um, the goal being to enroll over a million individuals and be able to uh, deliver uh, harmonization of electronic health records, as well as uh, survey data, as well as um, uh, uh, genomic, uh, proteomic, metabolomic information to help guide um, research. Participants are strongly encouraged to be a part of that. Uh, I, I um, have volunteered myself and donated my samples, and I'm also a researcher who has access to that. So I want to sort of lead the way by volunteering myself in something I believe in. Now, when you get into the omics, which I was trying to explain between personalized versus precision, there are a whole host of these omics technologies. When I started in the field, uh, it was genomics, and the genomics were broken down into exome and uh, whole genome. Uh, exome really separating out the coding 1% versus the 99% non-coding but regulatory component. But there are also lots of other omics. There's pharmacogenomics, there's proteomics, there's metabolomics, there's an envirome, there's a pollutome, there's a microbiome, and there's an epigenome. And now there's a radiome or a radiomix, so a whole body uh, imaging that comes to form part of that. So uh, th this is some of the jargon that's thrown around uh, out there. These are some of the figures that you will see in papers um, that then focus on particular aspects. But I really think the power lies in being able to harness all of this. And if you look in the center there with systems network biology and data science, as I'll, I'll allude to, that's really where I think the marriage is going to be made uh, well. So, uh, you know, these omics domains and technologies, uh, if, you, if you talk about a gene, but then you talk about every single gene, that's really when, what we mean by genomics. Rather than a single RNA transcript, and we talk about all the sequencing components and the long read RNA sec, the single cell RNA sec, you know, we're dealing with transcriptomics and so on. Um, why does it matter? Because we're integrating this now, the technology, the biology, where it was very difficult to Sanger sequence one gene at a time, the next generation sequencing technologies now allow us to be able to do whole exomes and whole genomes. And uh, that can be done within a matter of a few weeks. Uh, that is now incredible power that's available uh, relatively easily uh, whether we use third parties or central core facilities within institutions, it's really piecing that together then with these data analytical approaches and study design and applications. And you'll notice uh, population level um, uh, analyses are also forming a part of this rather than just the individual. So, you know, individualized at one end, but really we're kind of going full circle and back on ourselves to say, well, how do we now impact that in whole populations? Maybe there'll be a population ohm uh, as part of that uh, ohm trend. Okay, so that's uh, a little uh, overview in genomic precision medicine. Uh, I want to just recap some of the central dogma because it's what we'll talk about. So it, I, I will not get into the details about this, but you'll all remember uh, DNA uh, nucleotides are the building blocks. DNA is arranged into chromosomes as an epi a genome that forms part of that. Uh, DNA replicates itself for mitosis or meiosis. It is um, transcribed into RNA. The RNA is then translated into proteins. The proteins then undergo post-translational modification, and they then affect metabolism, growth, and a whole host of other things. And it's usually a one-way um, one line that this uh, actually works. Um, some of the milestones in genomics that we've seen uh, you'll remember 1953, uh, Watson and Crick described the double helical structure of DNA. Uh, 1958, the semi-conservative DNA replication method was shown, uh, all the way through to cloning of Dolly the sheep in Edinburgh in 1996. So I was uh, at school super excited when I heard about these things and flavor-grown tomatoes. It kind of inspired me, uh, that and Star Trek, to want to go into genetics because it was like, this is the code book of life. This is the holy grail in biology. And then as I was sort of uh, entering undergrad, the human genome got sequenced. I remember the buzz uh, around that 2001, 
um, the very first genome was done. And there were two approaches, essentially. One was a standard approach with Sanger's sequencing style, and the, uh, the other approach being the shotgun approach, which Craig Venter um, uh, uh, propagated and uh, propelled forward. And that's really formed the basis of what our next generation uh, technologies. They've not just applied, been applied to the genome, but they've gone to uh, other aspects such as the transcriptome. Uh, and the, the goal being this figure, I'm sure many of you have seen this many, many times, that we've got Moore's law here, and then the cost of how much it is to uh, sequence, we're actually headed towards a $1,000 genome. I can't get whole genome sequencing done in $800, $850 at the moment through a vendor. That is the best price that I've got. Now, there is some negotiated discount on that. Uh, most other places will charge you about three to $4,000 for a whole genome. So I think we're getting there and it's a super exciting uh, space to be in because we're really looking at sequencing people at birth, which could then provide an incredible set of tools for the rest of their life, for example, within pharmacogenomics, knowing that somebody's going to have uh, uh, the, the altered metabolism that will lead to either ineffectiveness of the drug or side effects could just mean we don't have to waste uh, our time, the patient's time, and put the patient at unnecessary risk uh, or absolutely no benefit with something that's going in. So e exciting times uh, indeed. Uh, just to recap here about allele frequency and disease penetrance, the cases I'm going to show you, this is a really important concept to understand because here what we've got on the uh, y-axis is the effect size and here on the x-axis we've got um, sort of allele frequency within the population. So, you know, what is a polymorphism? It's sort of 1% uh, and then what is, uh, you know, what is a rare and an ultra-rare variant? The, <clears throat> the um, premise for this is that uh, if you have a deleterious variant, it's actually harmful Either it's arrested in utero and does not propagate, or um, people are able to survive at birth or survive at birth, become adults and then reproduce and pass those on. Um, that the milder they are or the more tolerated they are, the more likely they are to spread in populations. At the top here, really, what you have is Mendelian disease. That's the bulk of the kind of patients I see in my inherited cardiovascular disease clinic, where it's monogenic, it's highly um, it, it can be very penetrant um, and it can be very deleterious and uh, there's a huge effect size. However, you know, the vast majority of uh, cases that we see, uh, so over here on the right, most disease is actually polygenic or multifactorially inherited. Uh, some are due to chromosomal abnormalities such as Turner's X0, and then the monogenic Mendelian disease is five modes of inheritance, also more dominant recessive. X-linked recessive, X-linked dominant and uh, maternal, otherwise known as matrilinear or extra nuclear or mitochondrial. Um, here on the left in our inherited uh, clinics or genomic composition, we're very good at doing pedigrees. That's the core basis of what we do because uh, doing at least a three generational pedigree will help us identify if there is a, a pattern to the mode of inheritance with this. So the symbols here, essentially a female is a round circle, a male is a square, an unknown sex is a diamond shape. Affected individuals are dark black, unaffected are uh, uh, transparent. Uh, heterozygous female, heterozygous male here, and then disease, spontaneous abortion, and child uh, uh, stillbirth here. And then sort of mating, and this double barring suggests consanguinity, uh, and then uh, usually monozygotic and dizygotic twins. And we may see evolution uh, with some of these pedigrees as we see the evolving nature of family dynamics. Um, some of the lingo that's used, just very quick recap, is penetrance, really important term, um, and variable expressivity, variable penetrance and expressivity. So here, really simple example, just to remind everyone uh, what this meant from uh, your step one days and preclinical days. Uh, variable penetrance, essentially, if we imagine that purple's uh, uh, binary color here and white's uh, 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 the other uh, binary component of that, uh, if you are 100% uh, penetrant, uh, then every single individual would be affected. But if uh, many people are not affected with this purple dominant allele, then it's less than 100% penetrant. On the next example, we've got variable expressivity. So everyone has a degree of purpleness, 
uh, but some are lavender, some are more towards a lilac, and some are more towards a deep violet. So you've got 100% penetrant, but variable expressivity. Um, and then you've got variable penetrance and expressivity. And why are they important? Because even though we have monogenic disease, that's really what we actually see. And that's what makes delivering clinical cardiovascular genomic precision medicine a real challenge. For those interested, these are some of the core documents American Heart Association has produced. Um, and if anyone's interested, I'd be happy to provide my reading list and files for uh, anyone who wants to read a little bit more about this. So let's get into some cases and relate some of that overview I've given you into uh, real life cases. So here's one uh, I, I saw a couple of weeks ago, a 65 year old uh, female with a history of hypertension, diabetes, sleep apnea on CPAP, and she's had recent COVID infection and uh, she had been unvaccinated. She had a witness collapse at home with loss of consciousness without any warning. Her husband uh, evaluated her and noted grunting respiration. He said he could not feel a pulse. He moved her from the sofa to the floor because he thought that would be an easier way to deliver CPR. And he started CPR and within two minutes, she had return of circulation. She was alert, sat up, talking to him. She was neurologically intact when the ambulance crew arrived and in sinus rhythm. She was taken to the ER and admitted troponins were normal. An echo was done showing hypertensive heart disease. Uh, mild concentric LVH, some diastolic dysfunction. Somebody decided to do a CTPA and an aortogram. Uh, this did not show any dissections. If you look at the bottom right, the aorta is lovely and intact. And on the top right, you see the CT scrolling through. She's got some uh, changes to the lungs here, showing that she had had you know, COVID that's evolving over the last six weeks. Um, her EKG is here on the left. I'd like you just to take a look at that. Um, I'm going to read the report that was signed off by one of our board certified cardiologists. Sinus rhythm with occasional PVCs, ST uh, deviation and moderate T wave abnormality. So I think everybody can um, appreciate the T wave abnormalities here uh, and uh, here right the way through. So pretty deep T wave inversions and uh, QT interval here was measured by the machine as 434 not picked up by the reading cardiologist. Um, I was then consulted, hey, do you think it's vasovagal? What do you think happened? Do you really think it was an arrest? Do you think it was a mucus plug? Uh, the patients had recent COVID. So I saw this patient and I decided to take a look at the ECG in a little bit more detail. That's a wearing my EP hat. And I thought, hmm, there's a PBC uh, that's occurring. But what I don't like is what's going on here with the QT in this rather long ST segment. And of course, I calculated and got it to be about 560. Um, so then I said, uh, I asked a family history, which is, an, again, a really core cool part of what we do in inherited cardiovascular disease clinic. She said, oh, yeah, my son had uh, an arrest um, and uh, ended up with a defibrillator aged 18 years old. Did he ever get genetic testing? Yes, he did a research study out in upper state New York, upstate New York. And they told him that he had some sodium channel mutation. Can you get a copy of the results, please? So I got I got the results. They were very quick at trying to get that for us. Um, and uh, she said, you know, he also developed atrial fibrillation at age 39 and required an ablation. Um, and he's also had shocks with lots of BT. And her other son is also a carrier for the same uh, variant. She was told she had T wave inversion because of hypertension, which seems reasonable. That's what we've seen on the echo. So. Um, uh, I was very worried by the history and I thought mm, the QT is long here, two sons affected. It's a very good chance that she's actually uh, also got long QT and just not realized when I pushed a bit further, she endorsed having had a syncopal episode pre COVID as well. So uh, that made me think, well, okay, here, here, here's a patient where the syncopal episodes are not consistent with vagal. And while we were sort of getting her on a beta blocker and doing all of that, she decided to do uh, the telemetry strip that you see up there with polymorphic BT. She syncopized um, and she received a shock. So we, uh, her potassium was 3.7 and magnesium was 2. I put her on an uh, IV esmolol drip and uh, started her on a magnesium infusion, which is very good for torsades. And we were still seeing these PVCs. While all that was going on, she had four more arrests in front of us. So um, we then managed to get her on um, some nadalol. And that shortened things, but uh, really her heart rate was going very low. And I thought she's now bought a defibrillator. 
um, we're going to just AAI pace her uh, to be able to handle some of the low heart rate and get the beta blocker as high as we can. We actually initiated mexilatine 150 milligrams three times a day. And I just want to draw your attention to what happened to the T waves. So the T waves all inverted, the QT shortened. And here, if you measure it out exactly 60 beats per minute, you don't need to adjust by Bazette because you're at 60 beats per minute. And it got down to about 500 milliseconds. Not ideal, I couldn't really push it much further, but no more arrhythmia. So we exercised her just to prove that uh, her catecholaminergic response wasn't going to uh, induce more uh, VT. And then she was uh, successfully discharged and actually seen this morning and, and has made a really good recovery. Her genetics were done and surprise, surprise, she carries the same sodium channel mutation, which is a gain of function mutation. I wanna share case two with you. Uh, so this is a 54 year old um, colleague who works as a nurse, BMI 45, osteoarthritis, vitamin D deficiency, dyslipidemia, sleep apnea, presents with syncope without warning and an ankle fracture. Multiple prior episodes attributed to vasovagal syndrome, um, she was uh, noted on a 12 VCG earlier to have LVH. This was blamed on uh, obesity uh, and hypertensive heart disease. However, uh, the doctor first seeing her got a little bit worried with the fracture, uh, given that there was no warning with the syncopal episode and decided um, that, you know, perhaps uh, we should look at the echo in more detail. So you see the echo here showing quite pronounced hypertrophy. Um, and also showing outflow tract obstruction. You've got virtual cavity obliteration here. Um, and the gradients were measured uh, at uh, rest and then with Valsalva and managed to get up to 45, but not much higher. So it was thought, okay, there's obstruction here, but it's not really high enough um, to, of course, syncope. This is probably hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with unexplained syncope. You can see T wave inversions and voltage criteria for LVH. So an ICD was implanted and the patient was discharged. Now, um, she came back having had more syncope, and this time the echo, again, didn't really show much in terms of uh, gradient. So she went for a right and left heart cath, and here you see the right coronary artery, uh, essentially minor non-obstructive changes, and here the LAD and the circumflex artery. Uh, and here, uh, I'm not a big fan of hand injection of uh, LVs, um, but uh, I think they're a little bit worried about the cavity obliteration here. So a hand injection was done and you can see again on the ventricular gram here, uh, cavity obliteration. Uh, the right heart cath showed um, stonking cardiac output at nearly seven liters a minute with a cardiac index of uh, three consistent with a hyperdynamic ventricle. So uh, very uh, wise to actually do this. The echo wasn't showing this, so they decided to actually measure gradients. So here you see on the left here, uh, an aortic gradient and then an LV um, gradient. So here's the LV trace, here's the aortic trace. And here's just at rest, there's a peak to peak gradient of 93 millimeters of mercury. And then some PVCs induced and this got even worse. So it was pretty obvious that this patient's hemodynamics are dynamic and her outflow tract obstruction uh, was actually far worse. And perhaps this was the cause of syncope gism, given she'd syncopized again and no arrhythmia was identified on the ICD. So she actually underwent alcohol septal ablation. Uh, this was before she was seen by me. Uh, so here you see uh, the left coronary. You see a uh, wire put down um, here into one of the septal perforator branches. You see the balloon inflated and alcohol injected down uh, into there to cause an infarction. And then uh, you see here after the balloon's gone, uh, this vessel uh, no longer perfuses. And you see this marked reduction with the uh, abolition of that uh, gradient. The patient's then sent to me, an inherited cardiovascular disease clinic. Uh, and the working uh, phenotype is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with obstruction. Uh, we send off a genetics panel that's negative for known sarcomeric genes, NYBPC3, MY7, troponin I, troponin T, uh, PRACO G2, uh, which uh, uh, is an important uh, condition to, to rule out for us. Um, tightened truncating variants, but we almost always, in fact, we always send um, TTR hereditary to make sure this isn't hereditary amyloid, and we always send um, GLA, which is for Anderson Fabre's disease. Um, and uh, TTR was also negative, but she came back with this VUS in uh, the GLA gene, 
uh, which had not really been seen in other populations out there. So we recommended that all children are evaluated given it's likely to be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it's likely to be sarcomeric, even though the gene panel test is negative, uh, there may be a gene uh, as to unidentified at this present time, and therefore clinical evaluation of the family is what is required. So children were evaluated and one of the sons had some odd vagal-like symptoms uh, and it was actually uh, underwent genetic testing as part of what we call a VOS resolution uh, program. So uh, he actually carried this very, very same GLA variant. This time we actually measured his serum alpha-1 galactosidase levels, which were low. In other words, he has the same variant, but his alpha-1 galactosidase is low, which is consistent with Anderson Fabre's disease. Now note they were normal in the mother because females often are normal. So essentially we did co-segregation analysis uh, showing two of the sons actually had this VUS uh, and we ended up reclassifying this into likely pathogenic here, which you see on the repeat uh, re report. Why is that important? Because rather than just saying that we've seen some noise here and we're not sure what it actually means, it, it, it's actually very, very helpful to try to reclassify that to benign or pathogenic. Uh, benign because it takes away some of that anxiety, uh, pathogenic because we could use it for uh, evaluating other family members. Uh, the patient was not a candidate for enzyme replacement therapy because her alpha-1 galactosidase levels were normal. And we discussed about chaperone therapy, which is a new way uh, to treat Anderson Fabre's uh, in, in requires either normal or near normal levels. And this helps to aid some of uh, the movement of those enzymes. Uh, but actually the uh, company has uh, developed a tool where you can actually put in the genetic variant and that will predict whether they're likely to benefit or not. And unfortunately she doesn't. But the good news was that the sons do not show any cardiac disease at this present time. And uh, she, uh, they are receiving enzyme replacement therapy um, to try and deal with some of their other systemic symptoms. So what is Emerson Fabre's? It's a rare lysosomal storage disorder. It's X-linked inheritance due to a mutation in the GLA gene, which encodes for alpha galactosidase A, which is the enzyme that we actually measured. The classic phenotype is males were affected because it's excellent recessive, meaning that uh, females always have two copies. A male who carries it on the X chromosome, the Y chromosome, remember, is shorter than the X chromosome. So there's no corresponding second allele to balance that out. So the classic teaching has always been that X-linked recessive disease does not affect females, it's a male only type transmission. Uh, females can be carriers, males are all, all, always affected. Um, and the features that are seen are quite variable given that it's uh, a lysosomal storage disorder. So acroparesthesias, angiokeratomas, a cardiomyopathy, kidney disease with proteinuria, and uh, more rarely reduced GFR, cryptogenic strokes. Some variants, for example, this uh, N215S, Give predominant exclusive cardiac involvement. So, you know, here's a condition that um, is uh, amenable to treatment. It's rarely identified because most hypertrophs don't get genetic testing. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy genetic testing is a class one recommendation on uh, most societal guidelines, including Heart Failure Society of America, American Heart Association, European Society of Cardiology. Um, but the patients don't get referred, and you can make the diagnosis of Anderson Fabry's using genetics um, and uh, change management. So the phenotype can be LVH, which could be concentric, it could be asymmetric, it could be diastolic dysfunction, um, it could uh, be diastolic with systolic, but it can also have obstruction and virtually mimic any form of hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy that you see. Um, classically, what's seen on MRI is basal posterior lateral scar and low myocardial native T1s on maps, but conduction disease tends to be the killer uh, versus hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where sudden death is usually due to ventricular arrhythmias. Anderson Fabre's tend to have conduction system disease. And in fact, in, uh, in the UK, after uh, any young patient with cardiac conduction system disease, less than six years of age, uh, who uh, presents that way, after infiltrative diseases such as sarcoid, uh, Anderson Fabre's actually are most common uh, gene that we find. Uh, why do we have more of it over there than here? I'll be quite frank, you know, if you test, you get more positives. It's as simple as that. Um, 
So, you know, this is what we're actually seeing. So females can be affected due to this concept of X chromosome uh, inactivation, lionization. It's quite random which X chromosome on each resultant cell line gets that inactivated. So taking it back to this case, this case in the end, the GLA VUS in a female wasn't written off and the evaluation of the males with the enzyme uh, correlation was able to reclassify this variant. So, you know, what's the difference it makes? Enzyme replacement therapy, chaperone therapy, uh, which are actually uh, helpful. So I'll move on to case three very quickly. A 46 year old female presented with palpitations, hemodynamically tolerated sustained monomorphic BT and PVCs with a burden of 17%. Her intrinsic sinus ECG was normal, her echo was normal. A pre-procedural MRI showed a dilated RV. So you see the MRI here, it's slightly dilated. I don't have the cines playing, uh, but essentially there was no regional wall motion abnormalities. There was no late gadolinium enhancement of the LV. And we actually got very good pictures here with 3D uh, late gadolinium enhancement right the way through. And here you see the RV, there's no late gadolinium en enhancement there. There was no fatty infiltration. Um, so the patient was taken to the EP lab and had an ablation procedure done, getting rid of the uh, VT and the uh, PVCs. Uh, for us as EPs, terminating an arrhythmia with 10 seconds is usually a very good sign, makes us very happy. So after we finished all of that, we were like, well, you know, is it just an outflow tract ventricular tachycardia, which is a differential for arrhythmogenic ventricular cardiomyopathy? Uh, we don't think it's Brugada, another differential. We don't think it's sarcoid, another differential. She did actually get a CT PET as well, which was negative. Um, so we did a voltage map. And voltage mapping is, is tedious. You've got to make sure the catheter is touching. You've got to make sure that you've got you know, good contact there. And this is what we actually uh, found, both unipolar and bipolar uh, voltage abnormalities. So purple is healthy, red is really unhealthy, and everything else is in between. So tons of scarring. So here we've got physiological data showing us that this RV is not normal. The structural data that we have is that the RV is mildly or upper limit of normal dilated, perhaps more appreciable here, but no regional wall motion abnormalities and no scarring and no scarring uh, in the LV either. Genetics was done and a, and a VUS identified in PKP2, uh, uh, the most frequent gene found in arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. And this patient actually then got an ICD. But if you look at 2010 task force criteria, which I won't dwell uh, now, the patient would not meet criteria for a diagnosis of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So it really challenges, and, and you, you know in cardiology circles that the 2010 task force criteria are getting updated. There's an update coming out this year, and really, you know, we know now that arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy or dysplasia doesn't just affect the RV. There's an RV dominant type, an LV dominant type, but 60% tend to have biventricular involvement. Um, had we not have done the genetics, and yes, it's not a pathogenic variant, or done the voltage mapping, we could have left this patient uh, and not done anything further, uh, rather than giving her an ICD. So here, you know, EF normal gets an ICD, and guess what? She gets VT and appropriately shocked for it. And this VT, she felt it was much faster, more aggressive than that hemodynamically tolerated uh, VT. And she nearly syncopized here. So, you know, we saved a life, essentially, is what it boils down to. So um, I know we're a little bit short of time, but I'm just going to very quickly run you through this case that came uh, to one of my colleagues in Italy who reached out, uh, essentially a patient who was having PVCs. And if you look on the echo here, there's mitral valve prolapse. There's uh, maybe moderate mitral regurgitation, and then there's these uh, PVCs. So, you know, the question, should we repair the mitral valve? Well, it was only moderate. EF was normal, normal pulmonary pressures. You know, should we do a ZEO? Should we do an MRI? What should the follow-up be? All fair questions. A colleague reached out and I said, you know, there's this arrhythmic mitral valve prolapse, and, you know, maybe we should evaluate a little bit further. So we did a, an MRI. Uh, it's not going to play. Okay, so uh, here on this MRI, uh, what I want you to see is on the still here, there's this gap, this gap between ventricle and annulus, what's called mitral annular disjunction. But also, once we did late gadolinium enhancement, look at this scar in mid myocardial, um, almost circumferential round here. And the ECG was not normal, right? The ECG showed first degree AV block, left anterior fascicular block and PVCs that had a right bundle positive concordance. 
So uh, we then decided to do family history and look what we found, multiple family members with uh, sudden death with cardiomyopathy with mitral valve prolapse. We're not sure if they had mitral annual at this junction because the evaluation wasn't done, but we decided to do genetic testing and we found a novel truncating frame shifting variant in lamin A. And lamin A is a hot gene for us in inherited cardiovascular diseases because not only does it cause conduction system disease, it also causes structural abnormalities and uh, can cause sudden death and has now made it on the Heart Rhythm Society uh, recommendations that even if the EF is over 35%, if it's 45% and you have this variant, you should be implanting ICDs. So here, genetics, again, is changing the way that we actually look at this condition. And it's always bothered me, arrhythmic, arrhythmic mitral valve prolapse. Is it all just down to the mechanical complications that we see? So mitral valve prolapse, what's been described, this mitral annular disjunction, this pickle house sign that you see with the pulse wave Doppler here, um, and then uh, uh, sort of the push and pull idea and scarring within the papillary muscles and T-wave inversions, that's really what's being described. But I wonder if some of these are early cardiomyopathy or arrhythmias that are getting missed. Okay, what, what, I just want to give you a, a very quick overview of the, some of the research I'm doing. Uh, may I just ask the chair, when would you like me to stop for questions? So please go ahead. Uh, um, uh, you can. Uh, you, you you did have some more questions. Is that uh, you, you're asking? I, I was just. I wanted to leave it open for some questions from the audience. So oh yeah yeah yeah. Please uh, please. Uh, we will have a panel discussion whenever you are done with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, here's some research we've done over the last year. So okay. So the the big question, the holy grail of sudden death, and I'm not going to delve too much into it, other than to say. Uh, sudden death uh, is the uh, leading mode of death in the US, in Europe, in the world. Um, and most sudden deaths actually occur in people who have an ejection fraction of over 35%. Ejection fraction measured by ECHO is our best biomarker. Troponins, BNP, we know they're emerging as prognostic biomarkers in any disease state. Um, and combining those together, yeah, great when we can identify, you know, those people who, who express themselves. But really what matters is prevention and identifying the people who have subclinical disease. And really the question we asked here is, well, it, are we ready for gene first screening? Could we do a gene first approach to dilated cardiomyopathy? So this is our, our paper that's on a preprint and under review with circulation at present. Um, this was an incredible amount of work done by all these authors that you see here, but I want to just give a shout out to Ravi, uh, who's my, uh, uh, he's a remote fellow, he works at the University of Cambridge, um, a superstar, and uh, uh, Babkin Asatrian, who's based at uh, the University of Bern, who's, who's going to be a genomic precision cardiovascular guy, uh, uh, again, an absolute joy to mentor Gaith, who's my current research fellow. Uh, and then these are my collaborators, so Stefan Peterson, who's one of the daddies of Cardiac MR, uh, co-PI of the UK Biobank, and is probably going to be, I think, president of European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging. This year, Patricia Munro, Patsy, known to us affectionately, Anjali Owens, who's the director down at um, Philly. Uh, Varen Summers, my mentor, Chris Samsarian in Australia, Punka Jarora, who's, uh, who's a phenomenal researcher down at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Uh, Andrew Landstrom in, uh, in, at Duke and Daniel Muser in Italy. Uh, and Stefan and Louise, who are uh, colleagues in Mohammed down at Barts, London. So what we looked at UK Biobank said, okay, here we have you know, 500,000 individuals we have whole exome sequencing in 200,000 individuals. And we have amongst that, um, we have 42,000 and 39,000 with cardiac MR and 12 lead ECG. This is really because the UK Biobank is not able to image everybody, all 500,000. The funding is there for 100,000. And as it's being staggered with enrollment, uh, we're dealing with data as they become available. So if you marry that up in the center, in the middle, you get this 18,665 individuals who have cardiac MR, 12 lead ECG and whole exome sequencing data. So we wanted to look at, you know, what is the frequency, what's the penetrance and the expressivity of DCM-associated putative pathogenic variants in UK Biobank participants. 
Um, now, what we did in terms of technology was really develop our pipeline for variant calling. Uh, we validated it by identifying people with clinical disease within UK Biobank and making sure that the same variant filtering strategies actually picked out the top causes such as Titan. And that's, that's correct. We found uh, about 1,400 clinical DCM cases and 10% had Titan. That was by far the leading uh, variant. So we were very happy that our variant calling strategy, and we tested about 10, was able to filter these variants out. Uh, and so what we did was then uh, pick out these variants and classify them by the ACMG criteria. ACMG effectively says the benign variant of uncertain significance and pathogenic, and then in between likely pathogenic and likely benign. And so we then reverse phenotype these individuals in a blinded way to look for ECG abnormalities. And then if we look at the genes here as they're, they're arranged uh, by uh, the panel that we used was the ClinGen curated um, or approved dilated cardiomyopathy panel. Uh, this is what we were able to find. So you see yellow are the, those with phenotype, uh, pink are those who have isolated ventricular dilatation, uh, uh, blue are those who have hyperkinetic non-dilated ventricles, and blue, uh, darker blue are the ones who actually have full-blown clinical disease. So we found really that the, the uh, uh, frequency of variance was about 7%. And we found all these individuals with subclinical disease. Why do we say subclinical? Because their medical records are linked to these participants and they have thus far not declared, declared a diagnosis of heart failure or of cardiomyopathy, but we have their MRIs and ECGs. And what we're seeing are uh, MRI structural abnormalities and ECG abnormalities. We, uh, the Pinto criteria for dilated cardiomyopathy essentially says that there could be arrhythmia conduction system disease. Lamin tends to be that big one uh, that I showed you earlier, but then isolated ventricular dilatation with a normal EF. Uh, a hyperkinetic but non-dilated cardiomyopathy. There is another classification of isolated uh, scar, but uh, the UK Biobank MRI doesn't include late gadolinium enhancement. It does include T1 native maps, which at this time have not yet been analyzed. So, you know, we were identifying uh, subclinical disease uh, in these individuals. Now, whether it affects mortality or not is really the big question. And that's, that's what's been a surprise for us. Uh, here, when we looked at all 200,000 exomes uh, and categorized people into genotype positive or negative, now we did not, not look at their MRIs or ECGs. We just wanted to see if there was a difference in survival. And the hazard ratio uh, comes out about 1.1 effectively. Um, the confidence interval is narrow. I acknowledge it's close to one, um, but there's a signal. And this just made us very excited that uh, this population in the UK by when are age 40 to 69, middle-aged individuals, they do have healthy volunteer bias. You know, these are not people with disease. So we are seeing a more uh, healthy population that's been recruited into it, but we're starting to see this signal. And it really opens up an exciting space here that are we going to be able to predict uh, outcomes based on, on genotype? So I'm going to summarise uh, to just my closing a few statements here. So genomic precision medicine, you know, I've given you some examples of real life cases of how we're making a difference to patients. Uh, how do you establish that? That's been a common theme for some of my discussions today about how do you implement that in cardiovascular? Well, you know, uh, it's a multidisciplinary team approach. That is not a cop out. That does not mean that we all share the blame. Uh, what it actually means is that, you know, we respect and value each other because uh, that's how you actually get anywhere. We work together, we reach the moon, and every one of us comes with an expertise. The imaging people uh, can offer you techniques that may you may not appreciate necessarily that can contribute, such as doing 3D late gadolinium enhancement. Uh, the electrophysiologist can offer you techniques that uh, you may not understand or be aware of uh, that could help you figure out if this is prognostically significant disease. Or, uh, autonomic evaluation, uh, neurology could help us with that, with quantitative autonomic assessment. Um, genomics should be really uh, led by uh, genetic counsellors, and I'm a strong supporter of genetic counsellors. That's what we have in our clinic, because they help you handle a lot of the jargon and what happens with genetic tests when they come back with variants of uncertain significance. You see, the big thing is if you have a CT and it shows a head bleed, 
the radiologist very rarely calls you back in a year's time to say your CT, uh, we've reclassified that head bleed into uh, you know, edema. That does not happen. There, there might be a misread, sure, but every year reclassifying it, genomics is a moving target. So variants are constantly being re uh, defined. The genetic counselor not only helps with the pedigree and uh, explaining the disease to the patient and helping you interpret the genetic test, but helps at the follow-ups to be able to reclassify these variants. Pediatrics, essential. How can you see the family if some family members are under the age of 18? You can't. You need specialist pediatric cardiologists who understand this and will work with you and perhaps will help you do variant reclassification by doing um, uh, co-segregation analyses, as we've shown in some of the examples today, building out registries, having multidisciplinary meetings, uh, inviting pathologists for those cardiac arrest cases. How do you know what is going on in the heart if a cardiac pathologist has not evaluated them? My relationship with our local coroners is one of respect, where we say, look, let us help you we understand that you're looking from a general pathology perspective, but we'll get it sent to Bill Edwards or Joe Malachewski up at Mayo, and we'll be able to help categorize whether this is really a cardiac death that's sudden death, or maybe it's not a cardiac death, and sometimes it's just a sudden neurological death that's being ignored. Um, on the right, I put Genomics England because I, 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 I want to um, share with you that you see clinical genetics in England is over um, subscribed by patients. There's not enough providers. There's a long wait list. You can't get people in. But because the vision there is that genomics is so big and it's here, whether you adopt it or not, patients are going to get direct to consumer tests done. They're going to turn up in your clinic wanting to know what to do about it. You could say, well, we didn't order the test. Why should we? But Apple put the Apple Watch out there and people get their ECGs done, they send it to me. Apple don't pay me any royalties. Apple, do, Apple don't pay me a single fee to evaluate that ECG. When did they get into the ECG business and start charging us? These are questions that we need to have, right? So similar with direct-to-consumer genetic testing. So what Genomics England has done is devolve the service. What we mean by that is they want champions within each specialty. So neurologists, there's a musculoskeletal, there's a, a movement disorder specialist, a stroke specialist, dementia, et cetera, but they want a urologist who's a geneticist. They want a cardiovascular guy who's EP intervention, but find somebody who's a lead for genomics and do your bread and butter, but send the complex stuff, sort of the congenital diagnostic odyssey, pediatric case, you have no idea what's going on to them. That's what they actually want to help with within clinical genetics. So that I think is, is what needs to happen in the US. The multidisciplinary team approach, I just want you to understand that, you know, this is where we are currently, but the future is to combine all of this with research. Here's some of the biobanks out there that are working and some of the consortia to try to answer some of these problems. But I think it's an exciting space because we can go from- Thank you, Courtney. I'll see you tomorrow morning and back again um, very, very quickly. So here in this uh, figure in an article we published, we're talking about arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy uh, and how we're able to apply those things and bring things uh, back to the patient. But you could put any uh, monogenic cardiovascular disease there. In fact, even multifactorially inherited cardiac disease there, people are looking at coronary artery disease, for example, and trying to integrate those aspects uh, to redefine where we are. So a super exciting space to go bedside bench and back again as needed and rephenotype um, patients. The data collection, data harmonization, this is crucial. Uh, Partha, we talked about this in detail um, and uh, I talked about this with, with your team, including uh, Navina. This is a crucial arm of genomic and precision medicine. Uh, I won't go into that in much more detail. I'm gonna end on the post-test. Uh, so regarding Anderson Fabres, hopefully you understand uh, with that question that actually the correct answer is D. Females can mimic all forms of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, including obstructive disease. And the reason is because of X chromosome inactivation due to lionization. And that's spelled L-Y-O-N-I-Z-A-T-I-O-N. The autocorrect change that to an incorrect spelling there. So uh, quick plug, Q1 this year, uh, Concepts to Practice, a Guide to Cardiovascular Genomics is a course that I developed with my colleague, Andrew Landstrom, amongst uh, uh, the two of us led the curriculum 
uh, development and content development. And we're very excited to deliver that. This will be available to any cardiology uh, practitioner, any uh, um, healthcare provider to be able to take this course. And this will really teach uh, over uh, 12 modules uh, what I've tried to give you in, uh, in about 45, 50 minutes. Uh, I, I, I should also say, you know, the senior colleagues within the AHH Genomic Precision Medicine Council who actually uh, thought of the idea and tasked Andrew and myself to actually do that, Spati Shah, Carolyn Ho, uh, Dan, Ray, Dan Roden, you know, it was their baby and they asked us to do it. And we've done it and we're delighted um, to be able to offer that. So I'll stop there. These are uh, my wonderful team uh, where we offer this inherited service. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Anwar. Uh, and uh, if, if you would uh, want us to bring back in Spotlight, uh, if you want to just de-share your screen, uh, then we probably will be able to bring in everyone together. Um, so if you just stop sharing that uh, and then we'll... Anyway, so I think uh, now it's an opportunity for us to um, bring Dr. Panettieri. Uh, and uh, and Kristen and I'd like to uh, ask uh, Ray, uh, Ray, where do you see and how as a uh, university uh, we are investing in precision medicine and what are the opportunities do you see uh, forthcoming from here onwards? Well, you know, my feeling is uh, that it's an exciting time. Uh, you know, precision medicine, as was quoted uh, by our past president, uh, was really the focus has been in cancer. And despite pretty substantial uh, advances, we're still on the frontiers. Uh, I think cancer is the perfect example. And, and frankly, um, it's been a bit disappointing, right? It's not the newest snake oil. Uh, but there's an issue about the value proposition in population health and how do you take what Amwar so beautifully described and put it into practice. Now, many of the cases you presented came from people who had a high index of suspicion to send you the case. How do we take that knowledge and generalize it to a primary care physician or a, or a regional cardiologist who then may have an opportunity to send uh, to a sophisticated uh, cardiac geneticist for follow-up, if you see what I'm saying. The other challenge we certainly have in practice is getting an entire health system to agree to genetic testing, uh, which is uh, quite an obstacle. Um, even Mayo has not done that. Uh, Penn certainly has not done that. So, so we do have some practical challenges, but I think discovery, the practice, the policy, that's a little different than bed, uh, bedside to bench and back, uh, is where we need to move. But I just asked probably a handful of questions, Anwar. I don't know how you might want to field those. Uh, I, I think they're very valid and, and relevant questions because um, if we look at Wilson and Jungner's principles of uh, what's required for uh, screening tools, uh, those principles are, are still valid to this day. Uh, I think they were very, very well put together and give us a set of criteria. We have to identify something that is a serious problem. It has to be of interest to society. It has to be something that is cost effective. So if you're gonna invest all this money, you need to be able to see the return on it and the return from a patient perspective, as well as a provider perspective, as well as a healthcare policy perspective, governments are increasingly involved uh, with how that policy is delivered. The Precision Medicine Initiative is a good example uh, of uh, a stimulus and an idea that's something that they believe in. So from a patient perspective, you want to live. From a doctor perspective, you want to live. From a state perspective, you want to live just long enough to pay your taxes. And then, then you should be gotten rid of. Um, so, you know, I say that tongue in cheek because there are people in Whitehall in England who do calculate that. Um, every now and then the emails leak out, right? So <laughs> anyway, uh, actuaries have been doing that for a long time anyway, right? Working out risk and determining where that goes. I mean, to uh, jokes aside, do are we ready to start doing everybody's 
genome at birth? I think the answer is no, we're not. We haven't got to that thousand dollar genome. And really even a thousand dollars, if you work it out, um, suddenly becomes billions of dollars, if not trillions of dollars, by the time you say, well, actually it's just the sequencing, but, but what about the analysis? That's where you need the brains and the systems biologists uh, or the people with AI, Arthur, who are gonna pass through all that genomic data to variant call, because variant classification is our Achilles heel in genetics, right? So uh, to be able to do that, um, is now suddenly adding more expense. PhD level, at least PhD, master, master's level and PhD level scientists effectively could go through and sort that out. It's not just a thousand dollars. Suddenly it's three times that plus the thousand dollars. To deliver that is, is you know, where we've, we've got to look at that. There is an argument. Why not do targeted analysis for high risk, high yield genes, right? And I think when something's very penetrant, that's reasonable. We do that already. We look for sickle cell. We look for thalassemia. We look for phenylketonuria, right? We even do some rare stuff like MCAD deficiency. How, how frequent is MCAD deficiency? <laughs> it's rarer than hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Far rarer, right? But we do it because it's actually quite penetrant and we can make a difference early on, right? So I think we've got to find that sweet spot and maybe we end up taking a set of genes a set of SNPs and say, let's do that. The pharmacogenomics, $100, you can do it. And maybe $100 at birth is worth doing for the rest of your life. I think the return is there for the rest of your life every time you prescribe a drug. So I think we, we've got a long way to go uh, in terms of sorting this out. I think uh, pilot studies, looking at uh, high-risk genes, maybe even just the ACMG actionable genes, the 58 that got changed to 59 or 60 recently, they may be ones that we do. But it raises ethical questions. Why is cystic fibrosis not on there, right? You and I know that that's because it's such a prevalent gene and it's sort of somewhat recessive. The probability of you just being a carrier, what difference is it going to make? But these are the questions that we need to have with the public. The public need to know, you know, what, how are we deciding what's important? How are we uh, saying that these are the genes therefore to, to target? You know, everybody will say from their perspective that that particular gene, if they have a genetic disorder, is of concern to them. Um, so, you know, I hope I've not given you as, as, as roundabout no, no. questions. I think, yeah, I think that's spot on. And, and I know Kristen will have questions. My one last question is that there was a focus on SNPs or, or on, on whole exome. Uh, sequencing, where do you think the epigenome fits? Because, you know, that could be her uh, heritable, right? Uh, and, you know, we haven't had such a discovery in that space. So that's a level of complexity in polygenic driven disease that is really quite interesting. Um, what's your vision there? Yeah, uh, epigenomic is not really my space. I don't really do uh, any work in that. I, I think we take a step back to exomes, as you mentioned. That was the idea that, if, you know, we've always been taught that that's all that codes for anything. And therefore, you know, maybe all the money lies there. So if you do your library prep and focus on the 1% of the, of the genome, that cost, cuts costs down considerably. I can do... Um, clinical trio whole exome sequencing for about sixteen, seventeen hundred dollars $1,700. So not bad. It was $10,000 only a few years back uh, with pretty good, good returns on that. Um, but what we've learned is all that we call junk DNA is not junk. It just doesn't, right. it doesn't make sense that why would you carry 99% junk? I always questioned that as a child. I was always you know, taught that and then at undergrad that that's the dogma. That's what you've got to say in the exam to pass the test. But I was like, this doesn't make any sense to me. Why would we carry junk around? You just don't, right? Yeah. And now Correct. we know that all of that non-coding is so important for regulation. We now know, and I'm, and, you know, I'm more lay with epigenomics, I'll be frank with you, but epigenomics can tell you what your grandparents ate. That's how heavy we're getting into it. I don't know that space is, is, is really... Uh, unexplored, um, but the testing uh, is increasing. I think, let me flip it away from the genetics onto things like microbiome, our environment that's interacting with us. 
I think this is fascinating, absolutely fascinating, because we are able to, you know, now identify which organisms uh, we we carry in our flora and what difference that flora actually makes. Just leaving you. Flora interacts with each other is absolutely fascinating. We know from Coumadin, right, that if you take antibiotics, there's a CYP450 interaction that can affect it. But we also know that if you're not uh, re-metabolizing that, the gut bacteria gone, that to me is early microbiome as well. It's not just the CYP450 interactions. Um, that makes a huge difference to how your, your INR is affected. And if we look at that, it's just, it's absolutely uh, mind boggling. Where are we gonna go with how that interacts with us? Because I, I, I think, you know, why does, if we look at why does everybody not get candida, right? Why is it only certain people get candida? Why do certain things trigger an investigation for retroviral disease if you see it in the wrong places and that sort of thing? Um, it's all down to how that microbiome, 90% of cells are, microbes, not us, right, in our gut and on our surface, staggering. What's our symbiotic relationship? I don't know, but it, it's an exciting space. Fascinating. So Christian is uh, uh, in the environment of uh, Rutgers, and I think she may or may not be able to ask a question. Are you able to pose a question or a discussion? Um, I'm not sure if you have the ability to uh, focus, uh, but... Uh, We'll see. Sir Partho, can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Now we can hear you. Yes. Oh, good. I uh, actually, Ray covered my one very specific question about scalability of knowledge to the primary care community. Because when we think about this, both from the cost side, that uh, was well covered in the conversation, but scalability of knowledge, you know, it, it's just tremendous when you think about all the components of precision health. And we're, we're focused so much on this conversation on biology and a little bit about AI. But if we think about, I guess my question could be, uh, if we think about the different facets that drive precision health, uh, could you share with us a little bit of the role you feel like, and you touched on it a bit, AI has and the strength that AI can bring uh, to the picture uh, from a cost side? I mean, it's, it's certainly a little more scalable um, than the DNA structure, et cetera. So if you could just touch on that, that'd be great. Sure. So um, full disclosure, my, uh, my wife's a primary care doctor and um, she uh, holds her hands up that she doesn't understand this stuff. Um, she's a relatively recent uh, graduate um, from a residency program and it just really highlights the complete lack of education. You do what you do preclinical years uh, you learn some of the genetic diseases, you pass the tests, how much of it do you actually see and apply uh, becomes very little and it's not a focus. The focus is, uh, you know, other outcomes are all your patients in your practice on their appropriate antihypertensives. Uh, certainly in England, there's, there's lots of rewards given for meeting those guideline-based recommendations for primary care, really incentivized to deal with that. Um, so that they don't have to refer on to cardiology because cheaper, they can deliver that care far better uh, than, than uh, we can in terms of cost and they're not gonna order lots of unnecessary tests. When I engage with the primary care doctors, um, the response almost always is we, we're just swamped. We don't have the bandwidth, we don't have the time to learn this. Um, and you know we'd rather just refer on, you can't refer it all on to clinical genetics as I was explaining, Genomics England is devolving this service because they want champions in each area. They actually want champions in primary care. So there's a curriculum, the Royal College of General Practitioners in the UK, uh, along with Genomics England, has, uh, has generated a toolkit and an online training platform to teach primary care the basics. I gave you a real whirlwind on, you know, the central dogma, some of the variable expressivity and penetrance and these terms that we're using. But really, these modules then go through it, and hopefully it's a refresher because it's stuff that was learned a long time ago, and then give real-life examples of where it might make a difference in your practice. I think what patients want is polygenic risk score and predicting, am I going to have an MI? Am I going to be obese? That's what they really want. That seems to be the bulk of what primary care is getting, along with what I call you know, recreational genetics, 
uh, I did my ancestry and I'm 10% Mongolian. I never thought that, you know, that kind of stuff is turning up in the primary care practices. And I think that's a good way to engage the, the public because that's stuff that, you know, people have always wondered what their ancestry is and, and genetics tried to help answer that. So I think education and I think empowering champions within primary care who can actually lead that, but also telling everyone that, listen, you know, this is not going away. And in the next 20 years, it's just going to be default for everyone. Epic already has a precision medicine tab. And within that, you'll find all the genomics, exomics, et cetera, uh, organized. If you, if you utilize that tab well and integrate it, if you've got your pharmacogenomics, it will stop you prescribing a medicine by saying, hey, you, just like you get an allergy, this patient's penicillin allergic, true penicillin uh, allergy, uh, caution with prescribing this. That is a beneficial thing that I think providers see at the other end. Hey, maybe it is worth investing in this. So I think pharmacogenomics is the next step to that, is the, the low-hanging fruit for people. How about, uh, I'm just alluding to Kristen's uh, point, um, where, where she was asking about what's the interconnection between AI and genomics. How about uh, if we were to design um, AI tools which can look through our uh, databases as we look through our echoes and images and ECGs and put alerts, okay, this, this is something is not within fitting uh, within the scope of what's being described and this could be a variant or the, the, the point is that uh, just the way you did the analysis, right? I mean, you connected the dots in that those cases and, and made a flag that look, uh, this is this doesn't make sense as a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Perhaps there may be tools or toolkits uh, which we can use to make it more scalable so that people can refer such patients to a, a, a person like you in your clinics. Then you can then take your hat on uh, your cognitive knowledge and then tease out the, the options. Uh, because something needs to do, how do a generalist or people on the uh, on the primary care door, know which patients or which sets of um, disorders to be sent for a specific targeted therapy, you know? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I think the, the, the bulk of my referrals come from other cardiologists who recognize that there's something odd here just you know, send it to, to me because I enjoy working them up and I usually get longer in my clinic to evaluate them. Um, plus I will do really, really deep phenotyping, the family history, the family evaluation. Um, I get referrals from any sudden death or survivor of sudden death cases. So, you know, intervention, they're calling it Minoka. We knew this years ago, you can call it Minoka all you want, but, you know, we knew people come in with troponin positive chest pain and do not have obstructive coronary arteries. Um, what do you think that is? It's probably myocarditis or a type 2 MI, et cetera, et cetera. But people have now switched on to at least get the MRI done on those patients and evaluate them and send them across. So uh, that tends to be the, the big bulk of what I actually get as a, uh, Mike Ackerman calls it, I'm a genetic cardiologist, right? That's what he actually says. Um, and I think it will become a subspecialty. So my, my referral base, general cardiology, sudden death cases, uh, coroners will call me. Um, they could call me equally as an EP and an EP would then say, hey, I need genetics, call this guy. I just wear those hats together very, very well. Um, in terms of you know, how do primary care pick up on it or could we leverage an AI-based tool to go through that? Yes is the answer because we do it for QT, for example. Mayo yeah. has a very good system called QT, um, uh, QT alert that Mike Ackerman set up. Now, if you ask them um, how useful was it, there's a lot of false positives that get identified. But any system that is designed to be sensitive has by its nature from the clinical iceberg, you know, if every uh, uh, abdominal pain was taken to the OR and found to have appendicitis 100% of the time means you're missing some, you know it, right? Um, it has to be. It, it just cannot simply be that you got it right every time. So we know that when we look at sensitivity, specificity, positive, negative, predictive value, 
um, a, a screening tool is by nature has to be very, very sensitive, right? And high negative predictive value. So when you start to do that with just ECGs, there's so many, is this QT prolongation? And I think privately people will express they're a bit frustrated by it, right? If you do that with genetics, I guarantee you that it will be far worse because at least with a QT, you've got a tool to measure it, right? You can say the machine's wrong. There was a PVC here. This is rubbish, right? Um, and uh, a human will then look at that. If you do the whole genome, there's going to be so much noise. Just sorting through all of that, I don't think is wise. You know, a whole exome, again, there's a lot of noise. Still 20,000 exomes. I think targeted panels in high-risk genes and pharmacogenomics is probably the way to start. And if we then leverage AI-based tools to pick those out and say, hey, these are penetrant, these are, uh, you know, disease that could be identified that's treatable, let's get in there and do that. And maybe genetics in AF, which at the moment, the right guidelines do not recommend genetic testing for AF. We do in our clinic, the Wood Darbar who was also at Mayo, um, who's now chief at University of Illinois, Chicago, discovered the very first AF gene with Tim Olson uh, at Mayo, right? And he worked with Dan Roden at Vanderbilt for many years as faculty. He and I were talking at Heart Rhythm Society uh, about genetic testing for AF. And I said to him, look, I normally look to see, do they have sinus brady or anything else that could indicate this is likely to be a genetic AF. But we know that if you look at AF that's familial, um, then these patients tend to have a higher burden. They tend to have more difficult to treat AF. They tend to have worse outcomes, including stroke. Uh, focusing on something like that, where there's certain SNPs in certain monogenic genes we've seen might be high yield, given AF is a, a continuing burgeoning problem, isn't it? It's, it's getting worse in terms of uh, how many patients we see with AF. And if we can prevent stroke with a, a, a validated treatment, such as an anticoagulant, I think we're going to save lives and, and reduce morbidity, and it's going to be cost effective. That's the kind of thing I think where we would start at. But FH, let's not forget FH, one in 250 individuals. And FH, when I was at medical school, Alistair Hall, uh, who's uh, one of the uh, uh, clinician scientists in the University of Leeds mentioned this and said it's just an absolute travesty that patients aren't identified or referred. They could be identified from their lipid panel in primary care. You don't need AI. Why are they not referred on for genetics and familial evaluation? It, it's, you know, I can't explain that one because that's the most prevalent monogenic disease we have in cardiovascular, more than hypertrophic or dilated and yet they don't get referred. So I, where I, what I'm getting at there is what is the disconnect that stops people referring when they know about familial hypercholesterolemia? We've known about 35, 40 years. You wouldn't, well, you, wouldn't you, know, think, cystic fibrosis, you, know, right? you wouldn't not refer cystic fibrosis. They will be in every clinic because they're like, uh, the complex, I don't want to deal with it. What stops an FH being referred? Sorry, Ray. Yeah, no, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, if we're looking at EMR patient flags, right, and it's driven by AI, there has to be a value proposition for the provider to follow through on that. Uh, you know, as you go through your epic, I get, I get a ton of flags that I often ignore. There has to be sort of a, a, a feed forward mechanism where providers and the health system are rewarded for finding these cases and doing the right thing, as so to speak, uh, it's not that easy. You know, cystic fibrosis is easy because these people get sick, sick, sick early on in life, uh, and nobody wants to nobody wants to do the comprehensive care. These other individuals, especially with sudden death, as you highlighted, one of the major causes. We have the AI capabilities of mining EMR, but then it comes down to a patient flag to the provider. And if there's no value to the provider to follow through on that, then it's, it's, it's a lost cause, sad to say. But that practical aspect has to be fixed in population health if we take on risk. Right, Partho? 
Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I'm very well aware of the time. It's uh, 20 past six. Uh, so I want to just make sure that uh, we, we can continue on this. This is fascinating uh, science and a lot to emerge in the near future. But uh, uh, for now, I think it's very relevant the way we summarized it, that, you know, identifying those sets of targeted genes that can make the highest yield um, uh, discovery for our patients, perhaps maybe the way to go. And who knows, uh, maybe using new AI tools and maybe developing some incentivization mechanism as Ray was uh, pointing out uh, for health systems and population-based uh, you know, uh, incentives to be used. Uh, but these are again, territories we have to navigate uh, carefully in the future. Thank you very much, everyone. I know this is uh, uh, late. Uh, thank you, Kristen, and thank you, Ray, for joining us. And thank you, Anwar, for giving uh, a very uh, interesting and insightful presentation. We look forward to for the continuing of our conversations. Okay, thank so you. long. Thank you. Good evening. <laughs>